Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy, and it's always a great pleasure to be here with Joe Stanley. Welcome to Jackie Felgate, Dr. Nick Carr. Good to be with you all. Hi, Hello. Darcy. Absolutely gorgeous as always to be here with you, Darcy. Spring has finally sprung, and I have to say I'm thrilled because I could not have survived any more cold snaps. Because look, I have purple skin. <laughs> it's not good for me. Do you feel like the sun as well makes you mentally feel better when it's Definitely. a little bit warmer and the sun's out? You just feel happier. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, Jackie. September is a great time of the year. It's also a big month on the men's health calendar, Dr Nick. Yes, that's right, Dust, because it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, which encourages all men of a certain age, uh, not the young ones like you, Dust. Not so young anymore, <laughs> I don't think, but anyway. Anyway, those over 50 to have a chat with their doctor about getting their prostates checked. Now, this is so important because early detection is absolutely key. The figures are astounding. Around 18,000 men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer every year. Most cases are in men aged over 65, but the symptoms can be pretty hard to spot, Nick, is that right? Yes, I mean, the complicated thing about early prostate cancer, it actually usually has no symptoms at all, which is why we need to encourage healthy men to get screened. And this used to involve both the blood sample and the dreaded finger test. <laughs> but these days, men, you can be re reassured, it's the blood test You're not only. how he laughed there, wasn't it, with <laughs> that, uh, Joe? <laughs> I think the women <laughs> say it's finally our turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, though, convincing the men in our lives to fess up when something's wrong and book in with a doctor isn't easy either. We've had many health professionals on the show saying it usually comes from a partner nagging them to go. Nick, is that reflective of your experience? And it's absolutely... You're right, and the nagging is worth it. I always say when a bloke comes in for a checkup, I said, Who told you to come in? <laughs> <laughs> because compared with other cancers, prostate cancer actually has one of the highest five year survivals, and that's if it's diagnosed early. Well, perhaps us men need to catch up with the women who've made regular breast and cervical screenings part of everyday life, and there have been some recent developments in both these areas as well, Jack. Yeah, absolutely right, Daz. Regular mammograms are a key weapon in the fight against breast cancer. Soon, the life-saving checkups could also be used to prevent heart attacks and stroke. New Zealand tech company Volpera Health has teamed up with Microsoft to develop software that allows breast screening programs to also assess people's cardiovascular health. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death for women globally, so this could really be a game-changer, Dr Nick. Yes, I mean, mammograms are used to detect breast cancer, but they can also pinpoint calcium buildup in the arteries of the breast, which are called breast arterial calcifications. And an American study showed that women with a high calcium buildup are at a 51% higher risk for heart disease or stroke. It's expected the software will be available within the next two years. And the good news continues in the field of women's health as Rwanda looks set to become the first country in Africa and possibly the world to eradicate cervical cancer. Rwanda introduced a national vaccination program in 2011 for HPV, the infection that can cause cervical cancer. Healthcare workers go door to door to encourage people to get screened regularly. And it's paying off with 90% of the country's girls aged 12 and over now vaccinated. Amazing. Great news, but, you know, Australia is also a world leader in the race to eliminate cervical cancer. We've been vaccinating 12 and 13-year-olds against HPV since 2007. My 13-year-old got her vaccine this year and I was very pleased about it. And it's such an Australian success story because the world's first HPV vaccine, Gardasil, was developed right here by scientists at the University of Queensland. The World Health Organisation aims to eliminate cervical cancer globally by 2030. Rwanda is now joining Australia as a front-runner in achieving this goal. Turning now to our oceans and the mysteries that lie below the surface. US marine geologist Dawn Wright recently became the first African-American to descend to the deepest known place on the planet, the Mariana Trench, which is in the Pacific Ocean. Her deep dive is part of the United Nations Seabed 2030 project, which aims to create a map of the entire ocean floor by the end of the decade. So cool. It's a brilliant story, this one. I'm fascinated by it. The trench is in the Western Pacific near the island of Guam. It's incredibly hard to get to. And to give you a bit of perspective, it's about 11 kilometres deep, which is 30 Eiffel Towers stacked on top of each other. Take some <laughs> courage to get down 
to that part of the ocean. And not, not only is it so deep, but the water pressure down there is a staggering 1,000 atmospheres, which equates to around eight tonnes per square inch. Yeah, I, do you know what? I don't even swim with my head under the water <laughs> in the bay. Yeah. No, I'm not going down there. Now, uh, only around 20% of the ocean floor has been mapped to modern standards, and only 23 people have made it to that depth since 1960. Incredible. So interesting. Dawn hopes her historic voyage will pave the way for future explorers to unlock more mysteries of the sea. Well done, Dawn. Now, from mapping the ocean depths to helping Aussie boys explore their emotions, up next, Dr Nick Carr and I enter the man cave to look at men's mental health. We'll be back right after this. Nick, as you know, I grew up in uh, the world of Australian rules football, which was a fairly blokey, male-dominated day. Uh, clear, not an environment where expressing your emotions was going to be your friend, Nick. But as a father of three boys and, and my beautiful daughter as well, I think I tried to evolve a little bit more around that it is actually a good thing to express your emotions more and understanding the sensitivity of uh, living in an environment and how we speak to females. And so you hope that our generation started to shift the needle a little bit on that front. Yeah, well, you know, I went to an all-boys school <laughs> and uh, that was a long, long time ago and sort of sexist talk and, you know, crying was just not an option. You were a sissy if you ever cried. Um, so it's great to see that today's boys are just getting a different role model and a different option and that masculinity doesn't mean you have to be all sort of broody and tough uh, and doesn't mean being disrespectful to women. Yeah, it feels like we're uh, making some uh, ground for sure. And we spoke earlier about the importance of regular prostate checks for men and how some guys have been reluctant to visit a GP like you for any sort of uh, physical complaint. Are you finding that's true for, for men and their mental health as well? So when I started in practice, which was a terrifyingly long time ago, it was actually rare back then for men to come and ask about mental health and uh, about their struggles. And I'm glad to say these days we do see men coming in uh, prepared to say that things are difficult. And, you know, I really believe that prominent people, sports stars and so on, come out about their own mental health issues. I think it's really made a difference in this space. Yeah, and we've seen the ads on TV teaching boys how to treat women, and as you said, Nick, we've come leaps and bounds from past generations, which we know is a good thing, but more still needs to be done to give boys an emotional boost from an early age, which is where an innovative program, Man Cave, steps in to help boys out of the dark and into the light. Boys sometimes live in a world where they have to have their walls up. They have inherited this idea of what it means to be a man. Don't cry, man up, be strong. And so what we try to do is show them that it's okay to show emotions and it might actually change their life for the better. Boys, are you ready? Man Cave is a preventative mental health and emotional intelligence organisation. We are trying to create a world where young men can grow healthy relationships and connect with what's really going on for them. The way we begin is through play. For them to see us being willing to connect with them in that way is a real powerful invitation that we're there on their level and we want to connect with them. That was pretty good, a little bit sharper though. Nice. We'll take all the boys in a, in a year level together through somewhat of a rite of passage. And they also need to know that today is a day for massive personal change and massive social change. Can you be your full true self at school? As the morning progresses into the middle of the day, we start intentionally bringing in topics of conversation that, in my experience, boys really want to have, but struggle to have. Today, there'll be time for laughter, and then there'll also be time for like some really respectful conversations. Does that make sense? A few hours in, people feel really trusted and respected enough to actually start sharing their story themselves. Cross the circle if you've ever lost somebody close to you. Whenever they do step into that sharing of their true world, 
It's like them taking a weight off their shoulders and going, whoa, I don't have to carry this anymore. So here is an opportunity for us to check in our baggage. Suddenly they've found themselves in a space where there's depth and there's gravity and there's vulnerability. Emotions will come up in a check-in because the reality is beneath that mask, the emotions are there. Young men are highly emotional people. We choose to run these workshops to hopefully give them the skills that whenever they get to that point in life where they're struggling, they know how to manage it. The skill of emptying your jar is needed by everyone. Before today, I wouldn't be able to tell my friends most of the things that I thought about. They've made my life better by doing this. I felt amazing. I was like, surprised that I was able to express myself as much as I did. Today, amazing, I loved it. It allowed me to open up for the first time I've ever opened up in my life. I remember this for a really long time. This program is so important for these boys because they will go out and be the young men that their families, their friends and their communities need them to be. Joining us now, the CEO and founder of Man Cave, Hunter Johnson. Welcome, Hunter. Good to see you. So good to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the House of Wellness. Now, we saw there the essence of the Man Cave is to empower boys to become great men. What are the key elements for you in making that happen? Well, I think we've got to start with the context we're in. I think it's a really interesting time for masculinity more broadly. You know, we're in a time which is like a post Me Too era. We see these world leaders like Donald Trump, but we also on the other side of it see the mental illness that is rampant through community, but also the impact on women and non-binary people too. And my whole belief is instead of designing systems around crisis management, Let's go early intervention. Let's focus on positive things and also like create a positive future state for masculinity. Like it's such a confusing time for masculinity. I'm like, who do we look to? And so our whole belief is like, let's work with boys really young, expose them to diverse, healthy role models. They'll have better relationships with themselves, better relationships with others, and we'll have better communities. Yeah, there's a focus on building men's emotional intelligence. Hunter, why do men traditionally need a hand with this? And is it changing in uh, each generation that you're seeing come through? Yeah, I think emotional intelligence is something that is so important for, like, the 21st century life skills. I think there is more input coming to us from our devices, from the state of the world than ever before. And having an understanding of our inner world is so important. So we can regulate our mental health, you know, our sense of self, but also how we engage with others. And I think, yeah, it's just the way I describe it, it's just the muscle that we get to flex and develop and learn. And with time and with practice in the ring, you know, we can be better people. Now, we know that suicide is one of the leading causes of death, of death in young men, the 15 to 44 year olds, and we see it particularly in the rural areas. Mm. So why do you think it's this age group? And, you know, what are we missing? Yeah, it's such a complex topic, isn't it? Suicidality and, uh, you know, the other side of it, we know that over 80 men a day are calling, like, the emergency helpline service, right? Mm. And so what we need to do is find a step in between that you know, we need to find... This is where community comes in. I think we're getting this meta lesson right now around the importance of community, around being around each other, just to even learn how to hold space for people. And I think, you know, particularly, you know, my brother's a farmer, works out um, uh, in the bush, and, you know, I, just even the conversations that we have. My other brother's a miner too, so, you know, so we're up, here I am talking about feelings for a living. Um, and, yeah, but I think there's, like, this inbuilt stoicism into um, particularly masculinity in our country folk, and I think that has beautiful strengths to it. You know, it's required from the nature of work they do. And I think also we're now at this point going, OK, well, because there's not as much community around, we need to support these people to start to come back into community and to, I guess, get more range in their identity so that they do need to be stoic and strong and hold themselves together. But the next day they might need to be vulnerable, to open up, to call a mate, to shed a tear. Sounds simple, but it is profound and brilliant, the work you're doing, Hunter. It resonates so much. But a lot of the men's health funding traditionally goes to crisis management, not pre prevention. So what, what are, we, are we doing wrong? And are we starting this education about expressing emotions maybe too late? Such a good question. And crisis is really important to fund. Like, absolutely. Like, things happen, like the floods, the droughts, you know, 
bushfires, like you name it, like there needs to be crisis funding. But also, if just to call it spade to spade, it's not generally that conducive to an election cycle that's three to four years long to think about something longer term. But, you know, there's a, a quote which I love, which is, society grows great when people plant seeds for whose shade they'll never sit. <laughs> so, like, how, what's our version, right? And I think we have so much to learn from our First Nations people who literally talk about seven generations' time. Like, that's their decision-making process. Not some short-term serotonin or dopamine hit now. It's like, what's the longevity, what's the legacy for our grandchildren's grandchildren? And I think that's what excites me, that we're even having this conversation on a platform like this. Well, thanks so much for the work that you're doing and sharing with us the way to raise our boys in a healthy, emotionally intelligent way. It's profound work you're doing, and thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. Coming up next, Gerald Quigley delivers a lesson in bone health. Plus, we meet the Afghan female refugees kicking goals right here in Australia, next on The House of Wellness. Bones are light, but they are strong enough to support our entire weight, to give us shape, to protect our organs and to help us move. But unlike other aspects of our body, keeping our bone health in check is relatively simple. Each bone in our body is reformed about every 10 years and two nutrients help build healthy bones for the future, vitamin D3 and vitamin K2. The key is that they work together to support another mineral, calcium in promoting strong, healthy bones. Vitamin D3 aids in the absorption of calcium from our diet. It also helps produce a protein called osteocalcin, which is part of bone mineralization. That's the important building process. Vitamin K2 comes into play in the activation of this same protein that's responsible for incorporating calcium into bone tissue. D3 and K2 complement each other in that they maintain bone integrity, support bone mass and bone density. For the best of both worlds, supplementation is also an option. Look for a convenient one-a-day dose made in Australia. All nutrients appear as a random mix of letters and numbers, but in truth, vitamins D3 and K2 are the dream team. And if you disagree, have I got a bone to pick with you? GQ, they're helping us bone up on our essential vitamins. Now, Jack, Australia's been called the lucky country, of course, and when you see the struggles facing so many people overseas, it makes you realise how true that really is. Absolutely. This time last year, the world watched in horror as Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. So many people tried to flee the country and grave fears were held for the future of Afghani women in particular, Jo. It was absolutely heartbreaking, Jack. Many basic rights we take for granted here, like education, civil liberties, and even simple pleasures like playing sport, suddenly became life-endangering pursuits in Afghanistan. Australia responded by evacuating dozens of athletes, officials and their families from Kabul, including 35 players from the world-renowned Afghan female soccer team. Now, living in Melbourne on humanitarian visas, the women are a symbol of equality, freedom and hope. Yes, win, win. Put it, put it, put it, put it. 31. Come back. Come back. When I play football, I, I found energy and I'm very happy to play with my teammates. And this is my second family. It may be an overused expression, but given everything the Afghanistan women's football team have been through, the term second family has never felt more appropriate. Last year, these women were forced to go into hiding as the Taliban took control of their country. We were all in our homes and we wasn't able to go outside and I feel like a bird that someone cut their hair wings and she can't fly anymore. I feel like that and I cried for weeks in home. It's been just over a year since these players were evacuated to Australia in the nick of time. And while the past 12 months have been full of challenges, the group's passion for the sport has only grown stronger. I really feel the freedom when I'm playing against soccer here. I feel that, again, I have my wings to fly and to catch my dreams and my goals. Football is um, the sport that saved me. I'm grateful and I'm so happy about it. 
With the support and resources of Melbourne Victory Football Club, this year the team are competing in Division 4 of Victoria's State League, but they've got their sights set on much bigger goals. They're really competitive. Uh, they love to win. Um, they love to go in hard. They really play like they're already international players. You know, we play a couple of teams that are like Sunday League players. They come out, they have a bit of fun, and then our girls come through like a whirlwind, wanting to win, score as many goals as they can. So they really have that drive to just keep getting better and, and play at a higher level. Back in Afghanistan, the soccer level wasn't too high. It was kind of basic, especially for girls. There wasn't many good opportunities to join Melbourne Victory, such a good team with good behaviours and such a kind coach I ever meet in my life. Go quick, Freya, let's play, 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 play. We're ready to uh, improve uh, before uh, we come in Melbourne Victory because trainings and uh, coaching is very great and amazing for us. Good, Raz, well done. Bar, play from the goal, Bar. The best part of coaching them is seeing them come out and smile and have fun and, and not have kind of put their worries aside in terms of just coming out and playing and feeling like they're a bit free. I've really begun to understand like the, the troubles they've gone through and how much it means to them just to get out and play. That means a lot for me, having had the privilege to play my whole life, I wouldn't know what my life would be like without it. So to see them come out and have fun and really enjoy themselves, it, it, it means a lot. With most of their families still in Afghanistan, these players are working just as hard off the field to support themselves and each other. I'm studying at the moment English language because we should have certification for the higher education here. So unfortunately in Afghanistan when we were coming there was no possibility to have our documentation and stuff from the university or school. So we need to do some qualifications and then going for higher education. I did actually, I studied English language but I had to take off for a term to find a job, like a full-time job, to support my family back in Iran because life in there is much harder and I have to support them. It's been one year that we haven't seen our families, so it's a big thing and it, this is the biggest problem that we are having right now. We have the girls that are younger um, than our ages, so we are just trying to cover them to as a family and give them the feeling, the hopes that one day we all will be together with our families. You know, living in a different country is hard, but uh, we are happy because we have each other and we help each other and support each other in different ways. In the future, the team are hoping to gain approval from FIFA to compete as an international team in exile, allowing them to officially play under the flag of Afghanistan once again. But regardless of the outcome, simply by continuing to play together, this team are sending a powerful message. Our team is the voice of the girls who are unable to have their voice or use their voice, who are not having their rights. Maybe rights to play, maybe rights for education, it's not ju just about sport, it's beyond the sports too. All the girls and women in Afghanistan, they look us and we want to show to people uh, we will keep going and we don't stop. Forever Afghanistan is on my heart and I love my country and I want to say we all, we all are here to support those girls who are in Afghanistan. Thank you. Australia was the first country to offer Afghani female athletes safe haven following the Taliban takeover. You know, it was a monumental task to get them here. It was very dangerous. Mm. I was lucky enough to be at an event where I heard the lawyer in Australia who was on the phone the whole time getting them out of Afghanistan, that rescue. It was really touch and go as to whether or not they would make it, and they did. But a lot of the girls that are here... The soccer team, their family's still in Afghanistan and it's very hard for them. They don't even know if their family is safe. And can you imagine living with that worry every single day? Yeah, it's very, very sad. The women's soccer team formed in 2001 with the express purpose of empowering girls and women and giving them the freedom to play sport. 
they openly declared the Taliban its enemy. So as you say, Joe, they had a huge target on their backs. We are so happy that they found safety here in Melbourne and now call an oval at the Docklands their home ground. So if you are out in the area, you can head out and support this incredible team and, of course, female sport all round. We're back after this. As a young teenage girl, I really struggled with fad dieting, developed, you know, a really unhealthy relationship with food and my body. And I was really on a quest to find balance with food and my body again. And that's how the JS Health community began because I kind of was just having a conversation on a blog. Surely there's a better way to live a healthy life. Surely we don't need to go through these torturous fad diets to achieve wellness and well-being. Jessica Seppel turned her teenage pain into a passion for empowering people with a philosophy of balance and supporting one's health and confidence. From books, an app, program, recipes and more, this self-confessed accidental businesswoman's latest venture is the vitamin world. I have been pretty obsessed with vitamins my whole life. It's sometimes hard to describe. It feels like a gravitational pull towards them. When it was a good brand, a reputable brand, good doses, good forms of that ingredient, I saw the way they really helped people alongside a healthy diet. People would walk down the vitamin aisles and see vitamin C, vitamin E, turmeric, magnesium, but what really, they don't really know what the, those nutrients and minerals do for them. So our formulations actually mention the solution on the label. So our best sellers are no surprise to myself, you know, having been very connected to what women were going through. Skin and digestion. The connection between our skin health and our gut health is very clear. Detox and deep bloat. To relieve abdominal bloating is a big thing because it really helps people to feel more confident. And then of course, hair and energy. Our best selling hair formulation for hair growth the Jay's Health community is genuinely the heart of what I do. You have to remember there was eight years of nourishing the Jay's Health community before there was any business. Helping people live a healthy life and thrive with health is my innate calling. It's what gets me out of bed every single day. So it's a holistic wellness lifestyle and we believe all are important. Self-kindness, self-care, um, and our vitamin formulation is just there as another pillar of support. We believe it's all important when it comes to a healthy life. How incredible are those Afghan girls we saw before the break? What an amazing story. Oh, it's remarkable. And what they've been through to get here, it was their captain who encouraged them to stay together when they finally got to Australia. And now they're thinking of presenting a case to FIFA to be recognised as Afghanistan representatives and to play on the world stage. I'll tell you what, they're certainly good enough. And I love the coach said they're so happy to be playing together. They never complain. They're obsessed with their football. They work really hard. And, of course, they want to win. And speaking of winners, if I have to pick which one of us works the hardest, I'd say it's um, Dr Nick. <laughs> because where would we be without all the medical professionals, especially during the pandemic. Well, th thank you very much, Joe. It's only been an interesting time. <laughs> to be honest, I've actually never known the system be quite so stressed and stretched as it is right now. But I also feel really lucky because I have a great team and it's all those others who are working hard, the nurses, the allied health professionals, particularly our receptionists who are at the front line, mm. and they're the ones that make it all possible. Well, how about this, Dr Nick? A recent poll of Australian workers showed unpaid overtime is on the rise. We're doing an average of 7.3 unpaid hours every week. That's up from 5.8 before COVID. That's almost a full day donated for free. And according to the World Health Organisation, working more than 55 hours a week increases the risk of stroke by 35% and the risk of heart disease by 17%. And that's a reason alone to aim for a good work-life balance. Well, not only that, but overworking is actually counterproductive. Research by Stanford University found that productivity falls sharply when a person works more than 50 hours a week. Um, I relate to that. Not to mention all the domestic unpaid work we do. What about that? <laughs> and, and we know that a certain amount of stress can be healthy, energising even, but it can quickly become too much. And being overstressed affects just about every system in the body, triggering risky behaviour such as smoking and drinking, and none of these are good for your poor old heart. 
Health is where the heart is, as they say, Dr Nick, and the heart is where our own hard worker within reason. <laughs> Gerald Quigley begins this week's viewer Q&A. Angina is an early sign that something is amiss with heart function. It presents as pressing chest pain, moving into the left shoulder and down the left arm. It can be brought on by exercise, by emotion or eating. This is a potential medical emergency and should never be ignored. Angina can be managed and more importantly, any underlying issues can be identified. Never ever ignore chest pain. Eczema seems more prevalent than ever, up to 12% of children and can sometimes be involved in the allergy march of asthma and hay fever. We need to use a bland cleanser and an evidence-based moisturiser, neither of which should contain a fragrance. We need to reinforce the lipids that protect the underlying layers of the skin. Vitamin D and omega-3 oils can reduce inflammation. Certain probiotics can play a role as well. There's no simple step, but it's a series of interconnecting ones. Our liver is one of the most overworked organs in our body. It detoxifies most medications and toxins. It synthesizes albumin. It helps produce bile so we can digest fats. It manufactures and stores glycogen for energy. Any disruptions to our liver can upset these functions and affect our general health. The herb of choice is milk thistle. If you feel that your liver needs some support, get advice on the best milk thistle for you. Your liver will thank you. the show we looked at improving the mental and emotional well-being of boys jack now you have daughters what are the most important issues for you when you think about raising your girls i think body image is a huge thing and what worries me is how young i've got an oldest daughter who's 10 and they're already worried about yeah. how they look and as a parent that's really concerning and the Butterfly Foundation, though, are all over this. They say at least one in four young people have serious body image concerns. And this is even higher for girls, with some reports stating that up to 80% of Australian women are dissatisfied with their bodies to some degree. It doesn't surprise me, those yeah, statistics. It's really upsetting, though, isn't it, Jack, when you think about it? We're seeing more varied shapes and more realistic models in magazines and on the runway these days, but then... You look at some of the images that you see on social media and there's the sort of plumped up lips and, you know, body parts that have obviously been uh, surgically enhanced. It changes... Are we changing the view or are we just replacing it with something else? Yeah, it's such an interesting topic, isn't it? And I think that false representation, young women have the pressure to look like that when in reality it's impossible. And kick-starting more open conversations about body image issues, it really has to continue, as is giving young girls sporting heroes and healthy role models to look up to. Women like AFLW player Rochelle Cranston. Now an opportunity for the Cats. They've got three players. One of them's Cranston. Will the kick get there? Cox came across. Cranston will follow up. Rocky Cranston. Can she create something? Of course she can. I've always loved footy. I always had a footy in my hand when I was younger. My family is all from New Zealand, so we're a rugby background, so it wasn't exactly like Mum took me down to Auskick or anything. I think Mum was appalled that I had a football in my hand rather than a rugby ball, but um, she's come around. She loves it now was living in Maryborough, small country town, knew that there was a women's footy team in Ballarat, so I actually moved to Ballarat to pursue playing footy. It was socially, it wasn't exactly serious, but something I really loved doing. And I got a taste for it in year 12. We played a um, equal opportunity day where the boys played netball and the girls played footy and I loved it. A leaper in the pack there was Phoebe McWilliams, charging through his Cranston, throws it on the boot, Rocky delivers. If it wasn't for football, my life would have ended up very differently. The opportunities it's given me, the friendships it's given me, I was overweight and then the opportunity to play at FLW was there, I knew it was coming and that was my flick of the switch and I went into I want to be fit enough, lost 30 kilos, got my passion for gym, bought a gym um, and now I just feel like my life is, it's not real because my job is something I love, doesn't feel like a job at all. Football doesn't feel like a job. I think I've ticked some really important boxes and I think it's made me mentally 
stronger, physically stronger. Um, yeah, so <laughs> yes, <laughs> it has definitely changed my life. Most of us would have been trolled. We always have some keyboard warriors attacking us and telling us to get back in the kitchen or... I have personally got trolled a lot for more for the way I look. I'm very much me and I don't really care about... I've got a lot of tattoos, I had, had dreadlocks. I'm probably a bit bigger than most, but... The thing is, you'll see lots of positive comments and you'll only remember the one negative one. I sometimes think, well, don't you guys have mums or sisters or anything? Like, what would you think? What would your grandma think if they saw you saying that? So I always try to think if, if I'm writing something or if I'm saying something, what would grandma think if I said that? So try and make it as positive as possible. So I just don't have time for those kind of people. I think social media is a bit of a trap that it does give the perception of women looking a certain way and fitness models and stuff like that that aren't always being that truthful. Um, I think AFLW gives you a very real sense of women. We've got lots of different shapes, lots of different sizes, lots of different characters and a lot of people just being who they are and good at it. So I really like the fact that AFLW gives that for young girls. I see it as a bit of a trap for body image and creating this perception of what a woman or a man should be. I still struggle with my body image. Um, I've definitely gotten a lot better over the years and I've also thought about it in a perspective of young girls coming through and being a role model for them. I know when I was younger, I really didn't have that many female athlete role models. I always looked like Kathy Freeman and stuff like that, but I didn't really have any strong athletic built women. Um, I think there's always this Women are meant to be small and petite and I always thought I had to be that and I've never been that. Um, but I think I have to think about what my body can do. I'm very strong and powerful, but I know there's always that pressure to look a certain way. Um, but I think about more what my body can do on the footy field and in the gym and stuff like that. So it's a challenge, it always is. We're gonna go down to mid shin and we're just gonna do five snatch grip deadlifts. So we're standing all the way up. I struggle with negative self-talk. That has been a massive one for me. Um, it used to be really bad. I did have a teammate once tell me though, how do you think that makes us feel when you talk about yourself that way? And I was like, oh, so I've never really thought of it, how it affects people around me. So now knowing that it's, made me change the way I talk and it doesn't always work. Sometimes I'm negative, but I just keep it in my head. But yeah, I've almost got a little angel and a little devil and they're fighting against each other. I'm sure everyone has that. But I try to talk to myself how I would talk to my friends because if I spoke to my friends the way I talk to myself, I'd have no friends. What would I say to my younger self? Oh, I've gotten asked this question a lot actually. And I've, I really don't know. I just wish I had someone who was like me, because um, I was very different back then. But I guess I'd tell my younger self that it will be okay. Um, you'll find your people, you'll find happiness, um, and you're not, you're not weird. <laughs> you are not a weirdo. <laughs> it's slapped clear, still they go, the toe poke by Cranston. It's gonna roll, let dribble, let deliver a goal for Rocky. So here's a few AFLW versus AFL facts you may not know. AFLW is shorter than the men's game by 20 minutes. It has 16 players, not 18. And the share in football is slightly smaller in AFLW, size four and a half, as opposed to the men's size five. And the best news, there are now 18 teams in the competition that's the same as AFL. Don't go away. Up next, number one draft pick in 2022, Swans player Montana Ham talks life in a hashtag. Uh, P. Uh, pancakes. Ten things I hate about you. A jumper. I have so many jumpers though. <laughs> Skiing. Breakfast. Hashtag busy. England. 
Tape. Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Ooh, uh, swimming. Actually, I'll go with um, 3AM by Max Price 20. Football. Running. <laughs> oh, that, could, that could be a problem. <laughs> Um, spiders. I'm, and I'm actually petrified of them. Like, it could be this small and I won't go into my room until my mum kills it. Now, we love positive news about the environment here on the House of Wellness, especially when it comes to saving our native animals, Joe, Well, in news that resembles sci-fi movie Jurassic Park, Aussie scientists are hoping to bring back an iconic marsupial back from the dead. It's amazing. The Tasmanian tiger has been extinct since 1936. It was wiped out in the 1800s. Now scientists at the University of Melbourne are working to right that wrong. There's been lots and lots of reported sightings of the Tassie tiger over the years, although none have ever been verified. It's literally our version of Bigfoot. <laughs> and if it comes off, the Tassie tiger could soon be seen roaming the bush for real. And scientists plan to clone the extinct animal from old specimens and by using the DNA from a closely related mouse-sized marsupial, the rather gorgeously named the Dunnart. It's all very space age, isn't it? I absolutely love it. I'd love to see, wouldn't you love to see the black rhino come back. Oh, if you think about all the animals that have been made extinct over the centuries. The dodo? Sure. <laughs> Let's see a dodo. Do you think they could just bring back my old terrier dog, Rusty? <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> I wonder where it starts and where it ends, though, doesn't it? It has got a bit of Jurassic Park uh, about it, so it does raise some issues, I think. Yeah, it does raise some ethical concerns about playing God and what impact reintroducing an animal into the wild could have. But those behind the project say the tiger played an essential role in the Tasmanian ecosystem and any efforts to return it will be closely monitored. Well, the Naturalisation Society that was talking about bringing out African animals, releasing them out in the outback in Australia, and we've seen... Devastating effect, you know, releasing rabbits, you know, in Torquay and what that's done to the environment. So tread cautiously, I think, on that, on that one. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you, Joe, Dr Nick and Jack. It's uh, been a pleasure, as always. And you can catch Gerald Quickly and myself again this Sunday on the House of Wellness radio show. And you can go to the House of Wellness website for more info on anything you've seen on the show. Thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. It's bye for now.